To read the data from the water, the scientists are installing an infrastructure on the seabed, which will gather the data, bundle it, and transfer it via special deep-sea cables to the analysis stations on the coast. With an instrument the engineers call worm, which uses extreme water pressure, they dig a deep channel into the upper layers of shell and stones until they strike a harder layer of rock. On this solid foundation, an accompanying diver lays the cable and immediately covers it with shell limestone and mud for protection. To power the detector and to transfer the data from the detector to the shore, uh, we, we have this uh, submarine cable, which is a, a telecommunications cable. Then to actually transfer the data, we use these, these optical fibers. So in, in, in the uh, Kane 3 net cable, we have uh, 36 optical fibers. To protect the, the cable from the possibility of um, boat anchors damaging the cable, we have this extra armor plating around the cable, two layers, uh, an inner layer here and uh, a thicker outer layer here. Further out to shore, it's, it's a single armor, and then when it's in deep water, uh, below a thousand meters, uh, there is no protection, it's just the, uh, the polyethylene cable. Soiton, south of Berlin, is the location of one of the leading centers of neutrino research, the German Electron Synchrotron, DESI. This is where a team of particle physicists developed the sensors from which Ice Cube at the South Pole is constructed. In this glass sphere, you see a photomagnifying tube. It's held in this optical module and is very light sensitive. As soon as a single photon falls on this side, it produces a tiny electrical current. The electronic module here in the upper part of the sensor emits the current. This is the glass sphere that protects the sensor from the enormous pressure of the deep ice. And inside we have the electronic module, which amplifies the tiny electrical current, digitalizes it, and then sends a signal to the ice cube laboratory on the surface. Thousands of synchronized sensors measure the precise time and strength of the light event and communicate the data. In their laboratory, the researchers are already working on the next generations of light sensors. They should be cheaper, simpler and more efficient. One idea is to conduct the Cherenkov light through coated tubes. The scientists are looking for ultraviolet light. The postdoctoral student, Jakob van Santen, is getting ready for his first assignment at the South Pole. You have to be really fit to fly to the South Pole. I have to get a thorough medical checkup. And when I get the OK, I'll set off for Christchurch, New Zealand. I'll have to wait there for quite a while until the weather conditions are right. Then I'll fly eight hours to the Antarctic coast and then one and a half hours to the South Pole. I've been working on the Ice Cube project for a long time, but I've never seen my experiment. I'm really looking forward to that. And it's great to be traveling to a place which only a few people have visited. The journey to the South Pole is an adventure for the young scientist. The Antarctic is larger than Europe. Its surface includes land, continental ice, and a gigantic ice sheet. 98% of the region is covered in snow and ice. In summer, the ice surrounding the southernmost continent melts to three million square kilometers, one-sixth of its winter surface. 
Because of the altitude of its terrain, the extremely low temperatures and low precipitation, the Antarctic is also one of the driest regions. In fact, the world's largest desert. It's many days before van Santen finally reaches the Antarctic. He flies the last leg of his journey to the South Pole in a US Army supply plane. He lands on the ice sheet at an altitude of 3,000 meters. It's summer here, and it's high season. Researchers come to the South Pole in summer. Only a skeleton crew remains during the dark, cold winter to keep the detector running. Everyone who comes here is excited to reach the South Pole, but some suffer from altitude sickness from the moment they arrive. It takes a few days to acclimatize. For the researchers, the new Amundsen Scott South Pole Station is an oasis in the middle of the ice desert. It guarantees their survival. The station can accommodate several hundred people. Everything here is simple and practical. But Scott and Amundsen, who were the first to reach the South Pole more than a hundred years ago, would be astonished by the comfort and technology. This is an astrophysics hotspot, deep in the eternal ice the researchers are discovering cosmic light signals. IceCube is searching for neutrinos that have flown through the Earth, ones that entered the Northern Hemisphere. Ones that entered the Southern Hemisphere are looked for in the Mediterranean, for only neutrinos can fly through the Earth. The KM3 net detector will also search for particles that have traveled through the Earth. Since the Mediterranean is more than 5,000 meters deep, Catania, on the east coast of Sicily, is an ideal spot for a research station. A team of European scientists is here to install the first section of the detector on the seabed. Physicists have adapted the structure of the photosensors to deep sea conditions. Water pressure, salt, and sea currents are formidable challenges. The sensitive electronic module has to be protected to make the most precise measurements at any moment. The biggest problem is that these objects have to be placed at a depth of 4,000 meters in the sea. Everything has to be correct because it's very difficult to pull them back up from the sea to repair them. So everything has to work perfectly before the mission begins. It takes a long time to produce and test each optical module before it can be released and deployed in the sea. This kind of physics, the astrophysics of neutrinos, is a completely new branch of physics. It's absolutely innovative. With these neutrinos, we'll make a new map of the heavens. The physicists register the sensors to sort the data they will receive out of the depths. In the Scott Amundsen station at the South Pole, Jakob von Santen is now feeling at home. He can reach the ice cube on foot. It's a beautiful day, almost no wind, summer temperatures of minus 30 degrees Celsius, glorious sunshine. The station is about 500 meters behind me, and in front of me, it's only about 500 meters to the IceCube laboratory. 
I'm going there now to see how our detector is doing. These rods and flags are the only parts of the ice cube you can see on the surface. Most of the detector lies one and a half kilometers under my feet. Ice cube is a superb neutrino detector. A gigantic high-tech ice cube. Buried two and a half kilometers deep in the eternal ice at the South Pole. It's dark down there and the ice is extremely pure. Light is able to illuminate ice cube without distractions. The eyes of the telescope watch for the tiniest flashes of light. 5,200 photosensors register the weak light of the particle traces, which can travel many hundreds of meters through the ice. When light signals are discovered, the sensors transform them into electrical signals and conduct these along the steel cables to the surface, to ice cube. Into the brain of the telescope. Hello. The first computer center has already been installed in ice cube. It registers all the data from the ice, filters it roughly, and then sends it to research centers all over the world. Data from each of the more than 5,000 sensors in the ice is gathered here. This is the detector's control center. It receives its power from here. Thousands of meters of cable and cupboards full of computers. Day and night, a small team of scientists monitors the electronics in the ice cube. I'm hired to keep the detector running, so whatever happens, I have to solve it. This makes me happy because these lights you see in the back, if you see green, yellow, red, then ice cube is taking data. Yeah. It's beautiful, eh? Yeah. It's very photogenic too. I've, I've been taking a lot of pictures here of the cables. And the... To keep the detector running, some of the scientists remain on the ice during the winter. Then it is minus 70 degrees Celsius here and always night. The sun stays below the horizon. Only the moon follows its regular course. This is perfect for viewing the iridescent polar lights, ionizing solar wind that meets the Earth's atmosphere and is diverted to the poles. But now, during summer at the South Pole, when it's winter in Europe, the sun never sets. It circles the pole at a fixed distance to the horizon. The rhythm of day and night is suspended. The day has 24 hours of sunlight and you can't orientate yourself on the sun's position. It's just a single day that never seems to end. Jakob van Santen's trip to the high-tech detector ice cube in the Antarctic ice ends after 10 solar days. A large computer farm in the grounds of Daisy near Berlin is both a modern memory and a gigantic computer. The data from Ice Cube at the South Pole is transmitted here by satellite. Disruptive signals and other influences are filtered out. We do this for billions of events in Ice Cube and fish out the rare events of cosmic neutrinos, 
Data analysis is a very complicated process. Where did the neutrino interaction take place in the detector? How much energy did the event have? And what direction did it come from? It's like looking for the needle in a gigantic haystack, looking for neutrinos that have so much energy that they could have originated outside our galaxy. The scientists continue filtering the countless events in the ice until they come across the decisive light signals. This is the raw data. We see the whole detector, but not in real time, much slower. I've only read out one second here. But that's 1,000 times slower than in real time. Switch to real time, please. Then the clip lasts one second and flashes madly. Filtering the data more and more, the researchers arrive at their goal. The strongest light trails in the ice have a diameter of up to 600 meters. A 600 meter long light trail left by a particle so small that it's invisible. Now we really only see a trace. Here the trace clearly passes through the detector. A myon producing Cherenkov radiation, no question. Ernie and Bert are no longer alone. Since discovering them, researchers have been able to identify other cosmic neutrinos. The one with the most energy to date they have named Big Bird. We are hoping to be able to identify the sources of these high-energy neutrinos as soon as possible. The big question is, how is this cosmic radiation produced? How is it accelerated? What are the cosmic accelerators that must exist? I hope I don't have to spend the rest of my life researching these questions, but I definitely want answers to them. The sooner the better.